Um, diffraction is our next topic. We've talked about this in generic terms before. Now we need to think about it in terms of light. Um, I'm guessing most of you will have never seen one of these in real life. It's an old-fashioned double-sided razor, uh, which I wouldn't recommend. Uh, they are lethal. Um, but it's just showing the fact that you get diffraction around edges in exactly the same way that we've talked about getting, uh, sorry, diffraction around edges, in exactly the same way we've talked about getting diffraction before with waves on water and you know all sorts of other examples that we looked at. Uh, and it is just this bending around edges that we, uh, we demonstrated earlier. So we can do the same thing with gaps that we have demonstrated before, again, with, uh, with waves on water and all sorts of other images that I showed you. So in this case, we're putting uh, red light onto a small gap. We get a diffraction effect. We actually get some rather peculiar things happening the other side. It's not a simple spreading out always of the light, although that is happening, but we can actually get a pattern forming. So we have bright bits, darker bits, bright bits, darker bits, and so on. All right, so if we look at that screen, which is essentially what the picture on the uh, left is showing you, we've got this really broad bright bit in the middle and then a dark band, another bright bit, dark band, a bright bit, and so on. So there's some really complex effects going on as we put light through this small gap. Now remember, to get diffraction we need a gap that is comparable in size to the wavelength of the wave coming in. Right? That was one of the principles we established right at the very, very beginning. So we are talking about gaps here that are comparable to the wavelength of visible light. So these are, these are small gaps we're talking about. But taking that forward now, we can do exactly the same sort of thing that we did with our two loudspeakers and producing an interference pattern with sound waves. We can do it now with light. We can produce an interference pattern. Um, and the, it was a guy, surprise, surprise, called Young, who first put all this together some time back. Um, and this is classically referred to as the Young's double slit experiment, right? It, there are two slits as opposed to the one I showed you on the previous slide. Now, what do we need for an interference pattern? What is the critical thing we need in terms of a re relationship between our two sources of waves? Come on, I've heard vaguely the right thing being whispered. Someone be very phase. Sorry? Phase no, not quite. Constant phase, Con difference. constant phase relationship. So even if they're out of phase, providing yeah. they stay the same amount out of phase, it's fine. Right? So it's a constant phase relationship. That is the key thing. And the way we ensure that with these light experiments, basically, is to have our uh, light source over here going through a narrow slit. So it's going to spread that light out. Right, now we're only worried, if I go back to that previous slide, we're only worried about using the bright block in the middle. Right? We're keeping away from all the other stuff. So if we just use the bright block in the middle and we put our two slits now here, they are both being illuminated by light that is spreading out from that one tiny source. So we are ensuring absolutely that we have a coherent phase relationship between the light reaching here <coughs> and the light reaching here. And it's relatively uniform uh, amplitude and that sort of thing. Okay, so this is, this is the analogue of two loudspeakers and one signal generator. All right, when we did the sound wave experiment. Entirely analogous to that. All right, but we're now talking about light instead of sound, that's all. So here's our one signal generator, here's our two loudspeakers, and out here, therefore, we get an interference pattern. So we get a whole region in space that is constructive uh, interference, destructive interference, uh, so bright bits, darker bits, if we're talking about light as we are now, and that pattern is going to remain constant in space just like it was with the sound waves in this room. Okay, so if we look at 
some plane that we put across over here, so we just you know see what's bright and what's dark at some distance, then instead of getting high levels of sound, low levels of sound, which is what you did by moving around in the room when we did that demonstration experiment, we're going to get a series of um, high intensity, low intensity, high intensity, and so on, uh, light, <coughs> right, instead of sound. And these are going to be referred to as fringes. So we have a bright fringe, a dark fringe, bright fringe, and so on. Right? So in the context of light, that is the language that will be used. So we've got coherent sources, in other words, a constant phase relationship. And we're going to produce then a region, uh, uh, sorry, a pattern of bright and dark uh, interference fringes on the other side. Okay, and the bright fringes, surprise, surprise, are occurring when we have constructive uh, interference. The dark fringes are happening when we have destructive interference. Uh, and it's not going to surprise you at all to find that we have exactly the same formula for calculating the separation between those fringes as we had when we did it with sound. Because the physics is entirely the same. The wavelength is now hugely different between sound waves and uh, visible light, but the physics is identical, absolutely identical, between one and another. So it's the same equation. Now, I told you at the time we did this with sound that I derived this equation for you, right? And this is the moment we should do that. We've just about had time uh, to do it. All it involves is Pythagoras' theorem, right? This is not complicated. Uh, it just means that you've got to set the thing up reasonably sensibly. So here's our system, here's our two slits, and this is some point on a screen on the far side of those, all right? So this is where we're going to see bright and dark fringes and so on. And the distance between the centre and wherever we're looking on this particular screen, we're going to just label X, all right? Everything else is the same, so the distance between our two sources this was the separation between our two loudspeakers, remember, uh, is lowercase d. The distance between the sources and where we're looking, so where we're placing our detector, in other words, uh, is uh, denoted by uppercase d. So exactly the same setup uh, that we had before. And if, for instance, let's say we're focusing up here on a bright fringe, so at this distance x away from the midpoint, we get a high intensity of light, a bright fringe. So we know, therefore, that at this point, we've got constructive interference. Yeah? Must have to get bright fringes. So it means that the difference in that length and that length must be a whole number of wavelengths of light. Otherwise, we couldn't have constructive interference. Okay? So that's essentially what's being said down here. The difference in the length of those two lines, which is referred to as the path length difference in our case, must be a whole number of wavelengths. Now, I've made this a modulus because actually I don't care whether it's I2 minus I1 or I1 minus I2. It's the size of the difference in the length that is important. Right, so I'm using these again in the same sort of way that I used them when we talked about beats. Right? It was just the difference in frequencies that matter. We forget whether it's plus or minus. We're doing exactly the same thing here. <coughs> now, we therefore need to know what that path length difference is. Right? That's going to be the source of everything that we do. So let's just take the top bit first. So here's one of our sources coming up to this point that is x away uh, from uh, the midpoint. And we'll put in some uh, uh, length scales in here. So we've got two lengths now. This path length, L1. This distance here is uppercase D. Um, and we know, of course, if these are separated by lowercase D, this bit here must be half that. Right? which means this bit up here must be the total length from our origin x minus 
D upon T. Right, so now we've got a right angle triangle and all of the lengths of the sides of that triangle. So this is where Pythagoras comes in. So we've got the square on the hypotenuse basically is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. That's it. Right, and we're going to do exactly the same thing now with our second slit down here. So this length L2 to the same point, remember. Right, which is x away from the midpoint. So again, put in all the distances. We've now got our right angle triangle again and all of its sides. Right, the hypotenuse in this case is L2, still got D here. In this case, we've got x plus half the spacing uh, between our two slits. So we've got another expression now for that triangle out of Pythagoras. All right, so we've got two equations. So now we're going to start playing with these as simultaneous equations. And the first thing I'm going to do is subtract one from the other. That's fairly obvious because it means I can get rid of this uppercase d squared immediately and eliminate it. So let's subtract one from the other and I've got uh, L2 squared minus L1 squared is equal to the difference between these two things is just 2xd. All right. Might multiply these two brackets out and you'll find the only thing that's left is actually the cross term in the middle. Everything else is going to subtract away. You might want to prove that to yourselves uh, offline. That's up to you. I can factorise this relatively easily. That's just these two brackets here. Right? Now there's a key point here. Look, this is the path length difference that we're trying to describe. That first bracket. The difference between those two lengths. Uh, this is fine. Right? We can measure these things. So now what we've got to do is to worry about doing something with that second bracket. So that's our next step. Okay, so now, instead of subtracting 1 and 2, our initial equations, I'm going to add them together. So if I add them together, then actually I end up with uh, L1 plus L2, which is the unknown thing that I'm trying to sort out, but it now equals all this stuff on the other side. Now this is the point, and you hopefully you'll recall this from when we talked about this stuff in terms of sound. I said we needed to have a spacing between our speakers that were small compared to the distance between them and you as the observers. Right? In other words, lowercase d had to be small compared to uppercase d. Now I made that point at the time we talked about the sound experiment. Right? I'm actually going to add now a second approximation. I'm going to say this only works if we're not too far away from the midpoint between our two speakers. In other words, x can't be too big. All right, start moving off too far to the side and it's going to break down. So if I make those two approximations, uppercase d is now bigger than lowercase d and is bigger than x, then I can start making some reasonable approximations. Because right? that means that these things here are very small compared to those two things. So I'm going to ignore them. <coughs> That's part of making the approximation. So I've now got L2 plus L1 is, a, given our approximations, the same as twice uppercase D, so the distance between our sources and detector. So I can stick that back now into the equation that I had at the bottom of the page over here. All right? So I've got my path length difference multiplied by 2d, that's my approximation to the second bracket that we had in our factorization, is equal to 2xd, which obviously I can rearrange. All right? But that path length difference we've already established must be a whole number of wavelengths. Because we're looking at a bright fringe. Must be constructive interference. So n times lambda must be equal to uh, x 
times lowercase d over uppercase d. Right. So I can actually find what x is now just by rearranging that. So our fringes then are going to be at n equals 0, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3 and so on. So I've just got to plug those in and all we're looking at remember is the separation between the slits. So what is the separation between that and that or that and that or that and that? Well it's just lambda d over d, which is precisely the equation I gave you when we were looking at the sound version of this. All we've done now is just to derive it, and as I say, it's, it's purely Pythagoras' theorem and a bit of factorization. What we've added in is an approximation. So this is only true if uppercase d is bigger than lowercase d, and if we're not too far off the center point of our interference pattern. And then this actually is quite a decent approximation. So I'm going to stop there. We'll have a